Hola, buenos días. Uh, me llamo Thomas Holland, uh, el director de Camino Seguro y Safe Passage. Uh, me gustaría agradecer a todos ustedes uh, para esta oportunidad uh, a hablar uh, este día. Um, organization Safe Passage and Camino Seguro uh, it serves the youth and communities surrounding Guatemala's largest garbage dump. Uh, we do this through education, health, wellness, and a road to better jobs and careers in the future. Uh, I also want to thank you all today for this opportunity uh, to gather with such thinkers, activists, and agents of change uh, who are together addressing the powerful idea of the shared human experience. And hopefully along the way, uh, imparting some sense of empowerment and genuine hope uh, in this incredibly daunting time, uh, both for the people of Guatemala, but also for the many others from around the world who are joining us today. So thank you and welcome. I want to begin uh, by asking each of you listening to do something for me now. Uh, something perhaps quite elementary as a visioning exercise, but powerful nonetheless. Uh, the question may sound quaint or even naive, to be almost audacious in its simplicity. And the question is this, will the world be a better place a decade from now? And even if we might have some differences as to the exact details of that future, or what the precise topography of that future world looks like, uh, the question is, do you think our children will inherit a better world than the one we now have? And when you say yes, you know, our eternal optimists, and then others a qualified yes, yeah, we have much work to do. For many, uh, it'll be a saddened and more reluctant no. Uh, there's just too many unsolvable, immovable obstacles that will prevent us from realizing that better future that we also desperately want. The problems are many. Uh, it could be the scourge of chronic hunger, material scarcity, it could be wealth and gender inequality. But strangely enough, in and of themselves, the problems are the main obstacles to their own solution. There's climate change, there's political polarization and paralysis, and this alarming rise of authoritarianism we're seeing in so many parts of the world today. And if you did respond with some form of no, it would be so, um, if not for this other medley of insurmountable political, societal, or economic obstacles that you just cannot see a way beyond, you would not be alone. In 2018, the World Economic Forum carried out a survey trying to track down uh, people's understanding of progress around the world in multiple countries, uh, whether it's in the areas of child mortality or extreme poverty, uh, both of which have been improving over the last half century, especially in the last 20 years. And yet, we find that most people do not even realize those things are improving. Other surveys find that the level of optimism in many countries, strange enough in developing countries, developed countries as well, that there's this sense that the world is not gonna be a better place. So my hope today is to offer an alternative vision of what might be coming uh, in terms of our collective empowerment so with individuals and a global community. So we can find a new effective solutions to these problems, of our hope, uh, create paralysis, and, and that engender such cynicism in the hearts of so many who might otherwise see light and certainty of real progress in the coming years. Stage in this historical context for this vision uh, of a richer and more empowered future. And oddly enough, it begins with what is inarguably the most unnerving and disruptive event in modern times, uh, the, the global pandemic that we're all experiencing at this very moment. So I wanna make what may appear at first glance an astounding claim, that what is unfolding around the world at this very moment is nothing less than the very first truly global event in human history. This disease uh, that began in a single city in China, within a few months has spread to the entire world, uh, ending the lives of hundreds of thousands and ravaging economies and bringing societies to a halt across the entire globe. What are we saying when we describe this moment possibly as the first true global event in human history? I know, it's a modest claim. But we're not just talking about its physical and tangible impacts, which were immense about the communal experience and shared psychological social impacts on all of humanity in such a short time frame. 85% of the world's workers are living in nations either under full or partial lockdown as we speak. Every nation on earth has documented cases 
say for a few small island nations who by virtue of their early border closings are seeing their economies devastated now by the lack of tourism that they traditionally rely on. So no country on this earth has been untouched. No society, not deeply impacted, no family, not consumed with worry about the very same things, hard, the thought of losing loved ones, fear of a lost job or a devastated economic future. No individual not looking anxiously for the latest news they can find about the spread of the virus. From a purely anthropological standpoint, we are all one tribe facing the same internal and external threat, all in a matter of three months. It's literally unprecedented. But what can we compare it to? I mean, the 1918 influenza killed more and disrupted societies in many places, but the controls on information at the time and the lack of global, global interconnectedness, it took years, decades for us to begin to understand the magnitude of that disaster. Even today, the 1918 epidemic still rests in this mysterious and hazy place in human memory, only now being discussed, again, as a potential analog to what we're facing. When we think of 1918, we commonly think of World War I and not the influenza epidemic. Can you imagine any history written about this era not placing the coronavirus squarely at the forefront of any discussion of our times? Even World War II, as it was unfolding, was not actually a major daily news event in a lot of non-combatant countries around the world, being seen as a distant event affecting peoples in a faraway reality. Even climate change, uh, the greatest existential threat our way of life, that actually does not qualify. Not because of its consequences, which are incalculable, but because of humanity's inability to experience and conceptually grasp the reality of it at the same time. Philosopher Timothy Norton coined a term called hyperobject uh, to describe climate change perceptually. It's too big, so for too much time, and it's being experienced in too many different ways in too many places for humanity to really get its collective mind around it. This pandemic and the universal commonality of our shared experience in the face of it in real time in every part of the world is unprecedented. And right beneath our feet it is seismically shifting the very idea of global consciousness. Even if it is far too early to truly comprehend all the ramifications of what that means. But what we can say is that when we speak of never going back to the pre-COVID reality, we must accept that no person on this planet can ever truly and honestly say that their fate is unconnected from others everywhere in the world. And that our singular lives, no matter what nation we call home, are not somehow intrinsically and forever linked to the fates and spiritual realities of all others. I mean, even if now so many governments continue to behave as if borders still reign supreme, that a single government or society can solve our biggest challenges alone. The virus has effectively destroyed that illusion even if many leaders will continue to battle against that new reality for some time. So that's the context, that's the catalyst, right? But there's some forces that have been underway for many years now, okay, that are gonna co-align with this catalyst to make real change happen. And the first has to do with the concept of global citizenship. Global citizenship, you know, this, it's, it's been a, a major marker in education uh, in the last few years, this idea that my responsibilities, my obligations are not only to my local environment, not just my town, my city, my state, my country. My responsibilities far supersede that and, are, and belong, my, my faith and my belief in others belongs beyond my own borders. Um, there was this rubber sticker that I remember about 20 years ago, and it said, think globally, act locally, which is absolutely true, still true. But I'd like to offer a newly adapted version uh, for our interconnected times. It might not be as jazzy, but it's think globally, act globally. See, technology means that global activism and advocacy and true impact are not only for those who can afford to travel. If we can Zoom to work, which has been our fate and experience for the last seven to eight weeks, we can Zoom to work. Imagine what others can do with Zoom to build and nurture actionable and authentic relationships internationally. And those relationships are the foundations of real change. The second force that we need to talk about is what's been going on roughly for the last two decades in education around the world. 
And it's been this seismic shift away from rote learning and discrete bodies of knowledge into creating dispositions of learning, types of learners, most specifically innovative, hands-on, student-centered, collaborative, uh, the idea of problem solving over memorization. And in education, we also like to think of problem seeking. You know, it's not enough to talk about, I'm going to solve a problem that I'm confronted with. The responsibility is higher now. We're problem seeking. We're going to find the problems and solve them. For example, our students at Camino Seguro, who, by the way, call one of the most at-risk and marginalized communities in all of Guatemala their home. From families, many of which are working in the garbage dump itself, picking and recycling refuse for 2 to $3 a day. And yet these very same students, because they have the tools and the right educational philosophy to support them, will have the opportunity to participate in projects with cohorts in other countries, including the U.S., engaged on it, and hands-on authentic problem solving. These are collaborators. And this is the real beauty. It's not a one-way street or a unilateral transfer of knowledge. While we may receive ideas on our end for technological solutions, for rain capture, or sustainable gardening, our students providing hands-on expertise and realizing the value of discarded items, upcycling, and higher and better use. They and their communities are literally experts in deriving the most value from what others might throw away. So it's a communal sharing of knowledge, value, and solutions. Uh, we don't see our students as unique or, or a standalone phenomenon or just merely lucky. Uh, they re reflect something that's going on around the world in many places as we speak. Um, if we live in a world where William Kakwamba, a boy in a drought-stricken village in Malawi, can create a solution for conveying water, a solution that today is changing the future of agricultural communities from Peru to Mongolia, and better yet, you know who I'm talking about because you know the book and film, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And this reality of empowerment, innovation, and solution sharing is not the future, it's today. Perhaps it might feel premature and even insensitive today to speak of the pandemic's potentially beneficial effects while so much suffering is going on. To speak of what its benefits might be for global consciousness in the future and awareness. But we would be deliberately missing the gigantic historical relevance of this existentially binding event for all peoples everywhere, catalysts that will accelerate forces already in motion, made possible by technology, virtual connectivity, free global communications, and a decades-long effort to move our educational model from rote learning and discrete knowledge to the value of individual empowerment and critical thinking and empathic problem-seeking. Those far-sighted investments and hard-won battles in both the technical and the educational realms are about to pay off handsomely in a world where actionable global citizenship is now going to be the rule rather than the exception. So I leave you today uh, with the challenge, the challenge of imagining this transformational possibility. We might be, for the very step, first time in human history, be able to combine the technical and the educational tools, and more importantly, the shared experience and resulting global mindset to finally use those tools to, to their full potential to solve the problems that have proven so intractable for so long. We began this conversation today with the fear that our global problems are simply beyond our means to solve. Uh, too much for us to overcome to ensure a better future for our children and theirs. Um, however, uh, we might very well be entering a new chapter of human history. Uh, will we leave behind the idea of global citizenship as mere rhetoric or just the province of specialized activists and see it as a future generalized norm uh, and self identification for masses everywhere? A development uh, that would remove all obstacles to progress that we've for so long found between us and the future world we seek. Bueno, te ves, gracias por todo este día. Um, I want to say thank you uh, for all uh, your work, everyone listening, uh, those who are speaking today, uh, for your gifts uh, for all of us. And from me to you, uh, all the best to you and your families for health and happiness. Thank you very much.